Great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Steve Orleans, president of the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my old friend, David Shambaugh. Um, you see right here a copy of his new book, which is actually being published today. And this is his first book program that he's doing. So we're thrilled that our old friend, uh, David Shambo is able to join us today for what is a fascinating walk through Southeast Asia, which talks about how the United States and China each have these differing influences and what it's gonna look like going forward. It is a fascinating, wonderful read. So I will have David speak for you know, neighborhood of 15, 20 minutes. I'll ask them some questions and then some audience members have submitted questions. So, and you can also submit questions through the Q&A function uh, on, your, on your screen. Uh, for those of you who don't know David, if you're on this call and don't know David, I'd kind of be surprised because he's one of America's best known China scholars. Uh, his title is the Gaston Seeger Professor of Asian Studies, Political Science, and International Affairs, and the founding director of the China Policy Program at the Elliott School of International Affairs at GW. Um, he's written so many books and articles that if I started to go over each of them, we wouldn't have any time for the program today. But suffice it to say that I, he has been a resource for me and the committee over many decades and truly is one of the great scholars who when he focuses on an issue, you really learn about it. I could talk about various books and how they've affected the way I think about China. But David, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. I can't thank you enough for everything you do for US-China relations and for the National Committee as well as me. Thanks, David. <laughs> Uh, Steve, thank you um, indeed uh, very much uh, for that overly generous introduction. Um, but also, I'd like to just start by thanking the National Committee for all it does and all you do to contribute to our um, fraught relationship, trying to make it less fraught, <coughs> uh, with China. Um, and to Margot Landman in particular, who has been working behind the scenes to make today's event um, happen smoothly, technologically and, and otherwise. Um, so uh, really, it's, it's a great pleasure, I have to say, um, to launch my book. This is indeed the birthday of the book. Today is the official launch date. I was telling someone the other day that, you know, it's like having had a four-year pregnancy and you finally give birth. Not that I've had that experience, but this book has been four years in um, research and writing. And today, you know, it's finally, um, out. So um, we're going to have time, good ample time for question and answer and, and conversation between us, Steve, and I look forward to that. So what I thought I'd like to try and do is to just provide our, our viewers um, with a general overview of the book first. Um, if nothing else to maybe entice you to go out and order a copy. You know, Christmas is coming, makes a very nice gift for your loved one. Um, no, in all seriousness, um, let me just uh, begin by trying to do three things, I guess. First, offer a few disclaimers and preliminary explanations about the book, um, how I got into it. Secondly, to kind of give you some of the major uh, takeaways and, and conclusions of the book, and then to wind up um, peering into the future um, and tell you what I think some of the possible alternative futures or scenarios are for uh, the United States and China in, in Southeast Asia. So that's a little bit of a roadmap for, for where I want to go, and then we can uh, get into our conversation and, and Q&A. So first, <clears throat> in terms of the subject matter, this um, is both an extension of work I've done previously on, on China's foreign relations uh, with different parts of the world, uh, as well as the international relations of Asia, but it's also very new to me. This is new terrain. I've never um, really worked uh, specifically on Southeast Asia, nor surprisingly have I spent all that much time in Southeast Asia. Singapore, yes, a couple of visits to Vietnam many decades ago to Thailand and, and, and Burma, but Southeast Asia, I have to say, is very new to me. And so when I had a sabbatical um, back in 2017, 
Um, I considered going back to China, um, but that was a little difficult. I'd had some difficulties and, and still do with uh, uh, going in and doing research in China as a number of my colleagues are too. But I had a really great um, opportunity to go to Singapore to the Rajaratnam School of International Studies uh, there, um, about which I cannot say enough. They were very hospitable. So I went there um, for half a year um, and initiated the project. I was also, I should say, the beneficiary during that period of the Department of State's um, International Speakers Program. So that um, got me around the region uh, and to India. I gave, you know, I don't know, 40 lectures in uh, 10 countries or something in, in that period of time. And then I went back the following, I hadn't quite finished all the, the field work, so I went back the following summer in 2018 um, for a couple more months, um, based again it's in Singapore, but at a different institution, the Institute for Southeast Asian Studies, who were also extremely hospitable. So I have um, great uh, gratitude to both ICES and RSIS. So um, that's the first disclaimer. Um, secondly, um, this is not just a book about China and Southeast Asia, um, of which there have been several published just recently, four by my count. Um, there's a little miniature uh, cottage industry or tsunami or whatever um, occurring, which is great because the field has needed new work on uh, China and Southeast Asia. And my book does look at China and Southeast Asia, but it also looks at the United States in Southeast Asia. Um, and I think that distinguishes it somewhat from these other uh, recent books that have come out. So the role of the US in the region is very much part of the story I try and tell. And it may surprise you, as an, but as an American, um, I was unfamiliar with a lot of that part of the story, the American part of it. Um, so that was a bit of an education. Third disclaimer um, is that this is not just a study of, of contemporary affairs. <clears throat> it's very much a book of history. Um, which is also uh, not my discipline by training. There are two full chapters and, and half of two others in the book that deal with pre 21st century events. In the case of the United States, this goes back to the first American council that was assigned to what was then known as the Dutch East Indies, otherwise known as Indonesia, who arrived there in 1802. And then that chapter proceeds through the Ameri uh, America becoming a Pacific imperial and in the case of the Philippines, of course, a colonial power uh, following the Spanish-American War. It then goes through the naval and commercial expansion of the United States in the early 20th century in Southeast Asia, then the Second World War in the Pacific and on the Asian mainland, Southeast Asian mainland. The entire Cold War, of course, of which a big part was the Vietnam War. So, um, so there's a whole chapter on, on all of that. Uh, in the case of China, it goes back obviously much further. It goes back to the Qin Dynasty, 221 BC uh, to 206 BC is when the first recorded records of interactions between the Han Chinese and what were then known as the Yue people, basically everybody south of the Yangtze River. They called them the Bai Yue, the hundred Yue's, <laughs> um, and the Dai people who inhabit Yunnan uh, to this day. So. That chapter traces um, the also the history of the non-high, non-yang um, trading uh, period and the so-called tribute system. Uh, it also looks at the protracted animosity between China and Vietnam, including the um, uh, really 900 plus years of, Ch of Chinese occupation and subjugation of Vietnam. Uh, it looks at Southeast, the Southeast Asia during the early 20th century when Sun Yat-sen and the nationalists used uh, different um, countries in Southeast Asia as uh, refuge, really, and bases from which to plan the revolution that finally overthrew the Qing. Um, then it goes through uh, the interwar period um, uh, and finally the post-1949 history uh, of the PRC's interventionist, I think is the only word for it, and, and subversive policies towards Southeast Asia through the support of insurgent movements in every single country, um, as well as its role in the uh, non-aligned movement in the Bandung uh, period. So, you know, if you're looking, if people are 
looking for information about contemporary Southeast Asia uh, and the region's interactions with the US and China, this is also the book. It's very much contemporary. It's got several chapters on uh, the current period, the last few years, but I just want to give readers or potential readers a, a warning in advance. If you're just looking for a kind of snapshot of where things are today, you're going to get a big dose of history if you buy this book. Uh, fourth and, and, and the last um, uh, disclaimer, I guess, is I proceed in the book from the premise, and I believe in general, uh, that the United States and China are now locked into indefinite comprehensive competition across all functional domains, political uh, systems, diplomacy, commerce, security, military, espionage, ideology, values, technology, education, research, public diplomacy, soft power, culture, media, global governance, and so on. I see the US and China as uh, competitive uh, in all of those functional domains. And I see the United States and China um, as competitive in all regions of the world. This is a global competition. As my previous book, China Goes Global, began to dig into, uh, what, six years ago. So this is the overriding um, defining characteristics of international relations today, and I think well into the future. So that's my starting point. Um, and Southeast Asia um, is a really interesting um, microcosm of that competition um, because it brings all those elements, those functional elements together into one geographic space um, in, in the region and across um, 10 members of ASEAN. Um, Timor-Leste is also a Southeast Asian state, but is not yet a member of, of ASEAN. Um, so um, it's an interesting way, prism uh, and microcosm through which to look at the US-China competition, I think. Um, so those are the disclaimers. Now, what are the main findings and, and takeaways? Um, first is Southeast Asia's own intrinsic importance. This is a region um, that is no strategic or ge no geoeconomic backwater. It uh, is extremely important in its own right. And, and the book does not just look at it as a kind of arena in which this, the big powers are playing. Um, it very much makes the case of the importance of Southeast Asia. Um, it's a dynamic and sprawling region. It spans more than 3,000 miles from east to west and over 2,000 miles from north to south between Australasia and the southeast to obviously India and South Asia to the west to East Asia to the north. It includes, as I say, 11 states, 10 of which are members of the Association for Southeast Asian Nations, has a population of 636 million people, uh, is one of the most heavily uh, and densely populated regions of the world, and has extraordinary diversity and heterogeneity in virtually all dimensions, cultural, ethnic, economic, political. There are no fewer than five different distinct political systems in the region. Um, so, and diversity really defines everything, which is one of the lessons I learned in researching this book is it's impossible to generalize about Southeast Asia. It's one should not try. <laughs> um, second thing I learned is ASEAN does not represent Southeast Asia. Uh, do not start with ASEAN if you're trying to understand Southeast Asia. ASEAN is an important institution, but it doesn't represent, it's not the kind of institution many Americans uh, would expect it to be or like it to be. Now, ASEAN um, is the sixth largest economy in the world on aggregate uh, with a nominal GDP of $3 trillion in 2018. So as I say, this is no backwater. This is a very important region um, and one that the United States, I think, as I'll tell you in conclusion in a moment, should pay much higher attention to. Second big conclusion is that while this Sino-American competition comprehensive competition um, is already broad and intensifying. It's what I describe in the book as a soft rivalry, not a hard rivalry yet. What do I, what's the distinction there? Well, a hard rivalry um, in my mind is, was a Cold War kind of US-Soviet rivalry where it was a tit for tat rivalry. Washington did A, Moscow did B 
Washington then did C to counter Moscow. It was really a very reactive co competition between the, those two superpowers. We don't find that, uh, or I don't find that in Southeast Asia. The two powers are both maneuvering, I argue, on their own. It's kind of like shadow boxing, looking over their shoulders, watching the other very intently, but they aren't premising their actions and their policies based on the other. Yet, this could happen, and I'll get to that in, the, in a moment when I get to the conclusions about the potentials for polarization. But I see this as a sort of soft, dynamic, fluid competition um, at, at present. Third takeaway um, is that the United States and China are not the only actors in this drama. Um, indeed, there are other regional so-called middle powers that are, uh, that are important to consider. Uh, Japan, India, Australia, Europe. Europe is the largest foreign investor in Southeast Asia. It may surprise some of our viewers. Even South Korea has now a new south, southbound policy. I was in the audience in Singapore when um, President Moon unveiled that a couple of years ago. And ASEAN itself um, possesses substantial agency. So this is not, and the book really tr doesn't try and paint a picture of two elephants fighting. This is a very complex region of which the United States and China are, are two significant players and powers, but they're not the only, that's not the whole story. Um, fourth uh, and last conclusion takeaway uh, is that I come to a couple of counterintuitive conclusions in the book. The first is um, what I call, I describe China as an overestimated power, um, while I describe the United States as an underappreciated power. Now, let me elaborate briefly on what I mean by both of those. So if you travel around the region, um, one is struck by, overwhelmed by, I would say, this pervasive region-wide narrative that China is already the dominant power and that B, this is a kind of natural state of affairs and that China is rapidly sucking all the regional states into their sphere of influence, a kind of 21st century tribute system, if you will, and everybody needs to get on the bandwagon. That is an overwhelmingly dominant but I would, I argue in the book, an incorrect narrative. I argue that um, China, that this narrative is overstated and I find that there's substantial uh, ambivalence and suspicions about China uh, in every country um, throughout the region. And if you look at public opinion polls that ISIS in Singapore has have done, for example, that is sustained in, in surveys like that. Second thing I find about China is it's a very uneven power same argument I made in my previous book, China Goes Global. Uh, Southeast Asia is also not an even power. It has some strengths uh, in certain areas, economic primarily, but relative weaknesses in many. I would argue that China's diplomacy, soft power, security assistance programs, and united front activities, and its relations with the overseas Chinese diaspora are all weaknesses. Um, that's a kind of caveat on this pervasive narrative. Um, and the third caveat is that the BRI, uh, which is, I should emphasize, is welcomed by most in the region. Uh, it's needed, more importantly. Uh, Mike Lampton's recent book, I think, is, does a brilliant job of describing that. This is very needed uh, infrastructure. And most countries in the region are on board the BRI train to some extent or another. So don't get me wrong there, but I find that China is um, overreaching, overstepping and encountering pushback and difficulties in a number of countries uh, around BRI. Now it's too early to say where that's gonna go. I think we have to wait five years, frankly, before we can come to any collective judgments. But I argue in the book that we may see more what I call Myanmar moments or Malaysia moments. Now in Myanmar's case that, is reference to the 2011 Mitsoni Dam um, decision by the Burmese government to stop the building and to pull back from China and to open relations with the United States. Malaysia moment that obviously has to do with Mahathir's pulling back from Najib's uh, all in China approach. I think you're gonna see more uh, countries having such moments, if you will, uh, with China. And we'll see, the big question is whether China will recalibrate 
its approaches as a result of pushback or not. Now for the United States, um, for its part, um, as I say, it gets next to no coverage in the regional media and social media. The United States government has a major public diplomacy challenge here, I would argue. Uh, and Southeast Asians have little appreciation or sense really of the breadth and depth of the American presence in China. One of my counterintuitive conclusions is that while the US does have weaknesses in the region, it has substantial strengths and this may surprise viewers. I argue it has greater strengths than does China. I know many of you are sitting out there thinking, what does he, why does he think that? Well, if you empirically go through category by category, I would, I, which I do in the book, <clears throat> I think the U.S. has a substantial, you know, it just dwarfs China in the security assistance sphere. Its soft power is greater. Uh, its diplomacy is a weakness. We have a real uh, neglect. Uh, we have this tendency to what I call fly in, fly out diplomacy. Secretary of State flies in, gives a couple of reassuring speeches, flies out, isn't seen for another six months. Southeast Asians are rightfully skeptical. Of, of the US diplomacy, but American universities, popular culture, <clears throat> and econ, even economics. The United States is no shrinking violet here. We do $350 billion in trade with Southeast Asia. That's not the 587 billion that China does, but it's not insignificant. Then if you look at foreign direct investment, um, people will be surprised to find that the American foreign direct investment in 2018, the last year we have good statistics for was twice the amount of China. Yes, 25.9 billion for the United States, 12.9 for China. If you look at total stock of FDI, this is my favorite statistic. American FDI into Southeast Asia is greater than China, Japan, and South Korea combined. So um, even, in, and we have 4,200 companies, American companies operating in the region. So I just find this narrative that one encounters throughout Southeast Asia is to be empirically untrue. Um, so what about the future? Let me conclude with a few uh, brief thoughts about um, where the region may be going and where this competition may be headed. So I posit in that in the last, uh, chapter four scenarios. Number one, further bandwagoning with China. Oh, and maybe you could put up the um, graphic. I have one, one graphic. <laughs> um, this is a, a visual depiction of where I see the 10 members of ASEAN today. And as you'll see, most of them are on the Beijing side of the neutral line. Um, so one can dispute you know, is that the right way to place each country? But that's my net assessment after four years of research. But I, this is a fluid and dynamic, um, uh, not a fixed or a static spectrum. Um, two years ago, in fact, it was slightly different. And some of the countries would not have been in the same order as they are today. This is a kind of 2020 spectrum. And if we revisit this one or two years from now, there may be some further movement along that spectrum. So, so, but the first scenario is that there will be continued bandwagoning as this spectrum illustrates. Um, second scenario is continued what I call soft rivalry, I just explained. And the good news to soft rivalry is it produces what I call competitive coexistence. It's not a tit for tat, zero sum, cold war kind of, of rivalry. Um, you can take down the slide now if you like unless people want to die. You can leave it up so people can digest it, I suppose, if they're interested. Um, so second possibility is um, competitive coexistence, both sides shadow boxing, watching the other, doing their own thing, building their own relations, but not in a direct competitive, not in an action reaction kind of dynamic. The third scenario is an action reaction dynamic, what I call hard rivalry, and which would cause a polarization of the region. And then the fourth scenario is what I call more neutral hedging. Now, hedging is a term that one encounters frequently in the region. It's kind of in the DNA of Southeast Asians. Um, not, they don't want to be tilting one way or the other, and they don't want to be forced to choose, so to speak. Um, it's a false choice. And for the United States, it's very important the US understand that that's a false, false choice. So where do I see the region going? Um, 
I would argue that uh, there's going to be more neutral hedging because I think China, I already see evidence that China's overreaching, overstepping, alienating others. And the more China does that, and this is the big question for the future. If you ask me, you know, what's the major thing, David, to keep your eye on? I would say it's China's own behavior. China can do itself a lot of damage uh, in Southeast Asia as it is, I would argue, elsewhere in the world. Or China can listen better and can pay greater attention and be more sensitive to the concerns of other countries. And if it does that, it's going to get along better. But I foresee that China, I argue in the book, is on a kind of autopilot. They're tone deaf, they live in an echo chamber, they believe their own propaganda, and they don't listen well. So as a result, they're alienating others. Now, what does that mean just to conclude for the United States? Just be there, provide Southeast Asians an option to China. Uh, when China becomes too omnipresent, too overbearing, too proximate, too manipulative, and too interventionist. So Washington, keep your cool, but get in the game. So let me stop there. That's a kind of synopsis of, of the book, hopefully it incentivize you to go get a Christmas gift for somebody. I think that was, that was a, a great, <laughs> a, a, tempting people to buy the book, giving a nice overview, which really I think left people hungry to read a lot about it. What, yeah. One question, you use the term interventionist uh, about China in Southeast Asia. You were referring to the pre-79 period. It wasn't clear um, what you were referring to there. Yeah, I was referring to the pre-78 period, 79 period, when China supported communist parties, insurgencies right. in every single country um, during that period. Deng Xiaoping came to power in 1978, as we all know. And one of the first things he did, with the exception of the Burmese Communist Party, was to tie them off, cut them off. So you're on your own. Uh, we will be morally supportive, but no more arms, no more money, no more transmitters, no more uh, real support. And, he, and they basically did that to the Burmese communists by 82. So that's yeah. that's the period. But I would he also then decided to fight a war with Vietnam. That was an intervention. No, I'm sorry. It was a self-defense counterattack. <laughs> <laughs> how, how many Chinese was it? I think more people may have died in that um, several months, more Chinese died in that several months than US soldiers died in the entire uh, Vietnam War. Close, but not quite. I and mean, we don't have real figures, but the best estimates we have from several scholars who have looked at this is in the neighborhood of 30 to 40,000 Chinese in one month or six weeks. Yeah. Was obviously the United States was almost 60,000 in over 10 years, but you know, that wasn't exactly a success story for the People's Liberation Army. Yes. Um, what I found so, so interesting, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great book. It's, and it's a wonderful read and it's, got, it's so interesting that we have a China scholar writing about Southeast Asia. Can you talk a little, and we have this, and it's good for America, by the way, we have this, what you call it, a mini tsunami of, of books about Southeast Asia. Talk about a little bit more about your decision because it really is unusual and where beneficiaries in our Southeast Asia policy is going to be a beneficiary. But, but talk about it a little bit. Well, as I say, it was largely circumstantial for me. Um, you know, one of the nice things, one of the best things of being an academic is to have a sabbatical every seven years. On, in 2009-10, I went to Beijing. I was a full senior Fulbright scholar in the Academy of Social Sciences, Institute of World Politics and Economics. It was not the easiest experience. I had I, that was just at the beginning of China's turn. I would argue, if we all look back on when did China make its turn to harsher uh, repression domestically and assertiveness externally, um, I argue it predated Xi Jinping. It happened in 2009-10. And in retrospect, I could see now the uh, early warning indicators uh, there that year. I got my research done. That book result, that research resulted in China goes global, but it was it was a tough uh, period. Anyway, seven years later, I had a sabbatical. China obviously had changed and become even more repressive during that period. One of the aspects of repression were more difficulties for foreign researchers. And in my own particular case, um, I published an article, as you are no doubt aware, in 2015 in the Wall Street Journal. They did not like the Chinese government, and I have there's been I've been under a kind of soft ban, uh, an invitation ban, ever since. 
So I didn't really want to go back, even if I could have gone back to Beijing for a sabbatical. And then I had this wonderful invitation to go to Singapore. And I thought, great, why not? And it was just so somewhat circumstantial. But once I got there and I began to see the richness of this region, um, as I say, I wish, you know, I discovered this 20, 30 years ago in my research and my career, but better late than never. <laughs> I, I took great, uh, there, there's some great irony in it because you have a quote um, at the beginning of chapter four from Alex Woodside, um, who was the person in my life who was responsible for getting me to study Chinese, that he was my professor of Vietnamese history um, in 1970. And I went to him and I said, I need to understand. He was an August Harvard professor. I was an undergraduate. And I said, I need to understand why good people, the American government do bad things, the war in Vietnam. So I want to start to study Vietnamese. He said, Steve, you can understand about Southeast Asia by studying Chinese. It's actually a better path. And you know, it may be useful in the future um, after this war is over. So why don't you start down that path? And that was about the length of the conversation. He then got me a fellowship to begin the study of Chinese in the summer of 1970. So when I saw that in your book, I said, here it's the reverse. David, one of America's great China scholars is now writing obviously partly about Southeast Asia, um, but partly about China and Southeast Asia, but mostly about, about Southeast Asia. Um, geographical determinism. Uh, you know, my, my father was a professor of geography and he was what I would almost call a geographical determinist. In the end, let's say looking 10 years out uh, with BRI going full force with Mike Lambton writing about the rivers of, of, of iron um, and a number of other projects. Are we gonna be able to compete even with your suggestions that we show up and even with China's overreach? We being the United States. I, we the United States. Right. Um, I think so. I was surprised that I say it's a kind of counterintuitive conclusion. I didn't expect to find that the Americans have a great depth and of position in across a number of spheres in the region, intrinsic strengths and respect. Yes, I must quickly caveat that by saying that as in other parts of the world, there is the view that American democracies become dysfunctional. We have all kinds of social uh, inequalities, um, systemic racism. We've withdrawn from multilateralism. You know, the last four years have not done the American image much good in Southeast Asia either. But if you, you dig down and you have conversations with people, say about China, it's not long before you quickly unearth this anxiety and this latent ambivalence and suspicions and, um, that are deep in Southeast Asians' perceptions. It goes way back, you know, passed down through generations, I would argue. It's not just about the South China Sea, you know, or current things going on. Similarly, if you have conversations with Southeast Asians about the United States, you quickly find admiration of, but not really a great appreciation for the range of things Americans are involved with uh, in the region. So I go through that in some detail in a couple of chapters. Um, I'm not, you know, because I'm an American, I'm not making that argument in that case. If I was from another country, I would look at the, the empirical data and come probably to the same conclusion. But as I say, I think the United States is an underappreciated power and China is an overestimated one. So, to, you know, to answer your question, um, we have a real strong foundation, Steve, I think the United States does in the region across, you know, these are 10 countries, stronger in some, weaker in the others. American position in Cambodia, Laos, not terribly strong. But there, there is an intrinsic reservoir of, of, of appreciation of the United States, um, fears of China, you know, so the U.S. is seen as an offshore balancer, all the military, the national security establishments in Southeast Asia, um, with one exception, really two exceptions, Myanmar and Cambodia, you know, are oriented towards the U.S. Universities, soft power, and so on. So I think we have a good position to build upon, but uh, we've got work to do. You know, this we can't just 
uh, sit back and the tyranny of you speak of geography, the tyranny of distance has always been a great um, inhibitor um, barrier for the United States in the region, particularly our diplomats. It takes a long time to fly. You get to Beijing in only 13 hours. Well, I'm sorry, it takes 22 to get to Southeast Asia. Um, and then, you know, so distance is a factor, but we've just got to make the effort. Our government has to make Absolutely. the effort. Especially in Vietnam, do, you know, here Vietnam is, you know, 50 yards from China. Um, do they, and you have them on the pro-American side of your of your chart. Mm -hmm. Do they worry about our reliability? Do they worry that, in other words, we, especially in the last four years, I would argue the Kurds were sold down the, the river. Did that raise concerns um, among the Vietnamese where they are just so close? Right. Well, maybe Margot could put that slide back up for a second, um, because one thing I want viewers to note is the position on the spectrum of where these countries are. Uh, so Vietnam, Singapore, and the Philippines are on the American side of the spectrum, but they're very close to the neutral line. They're not out towards the end. That's intentional. And why do I raise this? Because I think there's a misperception here in Washington um, that Vietnam is our Southeast Asian ally. First of all, they're not an ally. Um, Thailand and the Philippines are allies although the Thai alliance is a <laughs> not really an alliance. Anyway, there you can see, the point I wanna make though is that the Vietnamese, and I go into some depth about this, um, welcome the relationship with the United States as we should with them. We have overcome a lot of difficulties from our own war experience with each other. But the Vietnamese are very reticent to get too close to, and particularly in the defense realm. I talked to, to the defense attaches in our embassy in, in Hanoi, and I elaborate in the book how the Vietnamese are slow walking the defense relationship with the United States. The US wants to go much further. There's all kinds of limits that the Vietnamese are putting on it. Moreover, if you look at the Vietnamese-China relationship, it's a lot closer than most Americans appreciate and understand economically, party to party relations. Um, yes, they have South China Sea disputes, uh, they have history <laughs> they, that is not uh, pleasant. But anyway, I'm just trying to note that um, Vietnam uh, is pursuing its own interests and the United States is helpful to it in certain regards vis-a-vis -vis China, but um, it's not gonna get too close to the United States. Same with Singapore, you know, and then Philippines is another story has, uh, Singapore, Philippines is describable to one variable, Duterte. Duterte leaves the scene uh, and Philippines, I would assume or predict will go back on the other side of the, or sorry, will stay there, but move closer to the United States. So this is a fluid dynamic set of orientations these countries have. I think uh, Thailand is really the swing state in this competition. I make the case in the book. Yes, Thailand has a so-called alliance with the United States, but if you dig down, it's not really an alliance. And Thailand has been drawn very much into, into the Beijing orbit in the last few years. And the, United and the United States, after the coup in 2014, because of congressionally mandated legislation, we had to cut Thailand off in a number of areas. So that didn't exactly help the US-Thai uh, relationship. So I don't know if that gets to your question about Vietnam, but I don't yeah, want to- No, I think it does. And two of the three countries on the American part, or the slightly American part of the ledger, uh, have disputes with China over land features in the South China Sea. How big a role does that dispute play in kind of Southeast Asian views of China? Very big role for Vietnam. Um, less of a role, I would say, for the other uh, four Southeast Asian disputants. Uh, yeah, it depends whether you count Indonesia as a disputant over the Natunas or not. Um, I find, maybe another counterintuitive conclusion I stumbled across, I find the Southeast Asia, or sorry, South China Sea issue to be of greater salience here in Washington, D.C. than it is, in fact, in the region. <laughs> now, why? These countries are not happy. The other claimant countries, Malaysia, Brunei, um, 
um, the Philippines and Vietnam, they're not happy with these with China's nine dash line and 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 rejection of the Hague um, ruling and everything else in the militarization of the islands. They're not happy about it at all. But there's they can't do anything about it. There's the kind of what can we do about it attitude um, that one hears repeatedly. You know, they like the Americans to undertake their fun ops. But there's a kind of acquiescence to, to it, but a frustration with it. So it's not the front and center issue for Southeast Asians. If you ask Southeast Asians, what is your biggest problem with China? Um, believe it or not, they come back and they say, uh, too much commerce, too much business, and, and geographic proximity and diplomatic manipulation. They're, they're concerned about being overwhelmed by, manipulated by, penetrated by China. South China Sea is not a front, I find, uh, you know, my colleagues may dispute this, it's not as much a front burner uh, first order issue for these countries as it seems to be here in the United States. <clears throat> you can take the slide down, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, Admiral Blair, Denny Blair asked about Indonesia, who was the traditional leader, and obviously he was our commander at PACOM. Indonesia was traditionally the leader of Southeast Asia. What role is it playing now? Now, and is there any prospect of it resuming a leadership role? Uh, Denny, um, I hate to tell you, but uh, I didn't find much evidence of that. Uh, Indonesia leads from behind at best. <laughs> I have never been to a country that, especially a country of that size, that is so insular so self-possessed um, and consumed with domestic issues as Indonesia. Um, and from that's a variety of reasons, but this is obviously the largest country. It's the nat what many people think should be the natural leader of ASEAN. Other ASEAN countries, by the way, are quite frustrated with Indonesia. They'd like Indonesia to lead. But over the last uh, three Indonesian administrations, one doesn't see any evidence of that. It's just a very domestically preoccupied state. Um, and it's, you know, huge 4,000 islands, six, you know. So um, I wouldn't look to Jakarta to become a kind of regional actor. This is another mistake Americans tend to make um, when they look at Southeast Asia. They just look at the map and think, oh, Indonesia, there's the biggest country. That's where we have to concentrate our diplomatic energies. Um, don't think so. When I was in Jakarta, a, a wealthy Chinese uh, Indonesian businessman, and I had dinner at his home, and he showed me the back door exit um, in the event there were anti-Chinese riots <clears throat> in Indonesia again. And they've obviously occurred in other places. Malaysia has a whole system in a lot of ways that discriminates against people of Chinese ethnicity and rewards those of Malay ethnicity. How strong a factor is kind of almost a racist view of Chinese in Southeast Asia in their relationship with China? It's pretty strong. It varies again by country. Uh, it's probably the most pronounced in Indonesia. I was driven past in, in Jakarta, they, these, these um, attacks on ethnic Chinese and ethnic Chinese businesses occur from time to time. Uh, I think the last one was 2016. Um, and I was driven past this neighborhood in um, Jakarta, oh, probably a square mile that had been torched and is still uh, charred, literally. They have not rebuilt the buildings. Um, and there may be some messages there about why they haven't demolished them and rebuilt them. But it, it just flares up. And I have a quotation in the book from a very leading Indonesian think tanker who said, this is a, a fire just waiting to ignite. So the, um, and, and of course, we all know by 1965, uh, horrible um, uh, killings that went on after the failed coup nearly 2 million ethnic Chinese um, were killed in a six week period of time. You might've seen the movie, Year of Living Dangerously and others 
So I would say Indonesia, it's, it's very heightened, but Malaysia too, great sensitivities in Malaysia about it. Um, the Chinese ambassador there who used to be my student has, and his predecessor have both made public statements and taken actions uh, that have alarmed Malaysians about this so-called fifth column approach. Um, there are sensitivities in Singapore, even though Singapore is a predominantly Chinese uh, city state. Um, so the ethnic, the diaspora issue is still uh, very much alive and it's simmering in several of these countries, including in Cambodia and even in Vietnam. And I'm not sure that Western uh, scholars and analysts of the region appreciate the kind of uh, ongoing sensitivities there uh, concerning it. Mm -hmm. It was so it was ironic. So we had a coup in Thailand when when Thaksin Shinawatra was the duly elected prime minister of, of Thailand and he was thrown out in a military coup and he ended up being in China. So the great irony was China was protecting a democratically elected Thai, uh, no, of course, of Chinese descent, um, but was protecting him while we, even though we did put in place sudden sanctions, continued to have a relationship with the Thai military. Yeah, as I say, Thailand is really, the, to me, the most interesting case in amongst these 10 countries and has is the one case that has really swung into the Chinese orbit. There are different explanations for it. Um, one is the ethnic Chinese composition of the Thai population, 40%, I think, of Thais trace Chinese ancestry. The princess in Thailand speaks fluent Chinese, uh, practices calligraphy. Xi Jinping even gave her one of these friendship medals, right? They give out every year to the best foreign friend. She received it a couple of years ago in the Great Hall of the People. Um, the Thai, uh, then there's the BRI dimension that Mike Lampton's book, I think, really brilliantly uh, shows us. The military, though, you ask about. Now, this is a military that's been trained by the United States for decades. But now, close to 40% of the Thai officer corps have had some type of training in China. The Chinese, there's a joint munitions factory in Thailand. It's the first time China's done this outside its borders, where they're producing, I'm told um, on good authority from the PLA actually, that it's an assembly facility uh, you know, of Chinese uh, armor personnel carriers in particular that are being assembled in Thailand. The Thais have bought three UN class submarines from China in the last two years. Um, it cost a lot of money. Um, training and exercises, uh, intelligence sharing. The Thai-China military security relationship um, is from an American perspective, too close for comfort. Um, but, you know, if you're a Thai and the Americans cut you off as we did in 2014, again, because of congressional, because of law and congressional mandate, if, if there's a coup, you have to stop security assistance, even though we kept some of the Cobra Gold exercises going on a lower level, some of the ship visits. But, you know, if you're the Thai military, and this is a bigger point about America and the region, we're not predictable. We're not always there. Um, sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. They want constancy, uh, whether it's in the security sphere or, or diplomatic or, or others. In the United States, if we can do one thing in Southeast Asia, it's to be constant, be there, show up, be dependable. Uh, Helena Kalinda asks a question related kind of discussion of, of Chinese, but asks it slightly of, of Chinese in Southeast Asia. Can you comment on the role of Southeast Asian Americans in the region, region and the level of influence in the formation of U.S. policy? So that would be, you know, Thai Americans, Malaysian Americans, Indonesian Americans, kind of lobbying the U.S. government uh, to make policy towards Southeast Asia. Is that a Helena, that's a really interesting question, um, and thank you for it. Off the top of my head, I would say the Filipino American community, of course, is very active uh, in this country, um, as is, say, the Indian American community, although that's not part of Southeast Asia. Um, Thai Americans are too. Um, 
But um, natural, if what you're asking about are naturalized Americans uh, fr from different Southeast Asian countries playing a role in the American policy process, I don't see a lot of it. You don't see, well, Vietnamese Americans, I, need to, I don't know that much about and need to learn more. Uh, one may find greater activism in that community than I'm aware of. Um, but what you do find is activism in the region, uh, constantly wanting greater interactions with the US government, greater interactions with AmCHAMs. And our AmCHAMs are, are actually quite active and very engaged. As I said, there are 4,200 American companies operating across the region. Um, they want more engagement, not less. And, and so there's a lot of agency that Southeast Asians are exhibiting towards the US in the region. But I think your question had to do more with those here in the United States. Influencing, but yeah. Um, interesting question from Bing Wei, do you th you know, who's the founder of the World International Inc. Do you think there will be an age Asian union similar to European Union? In other words, does ASEAN remain what it is? Does it grow into more of a uh, of a stronger union? Uh, no, I don't anticipate that occurring. And that's one of the mistakes that Americans tend to make when they look at ASEAN is to sort of take the EU template and think this is some sort of Asian version of the EU. You know, the EU itself has all of its own uh, intrinsic peculiarities. Believe me, I've spent a lot of my time and career uh, working on transatlantic issues and in, in, in Brussels with the EU. But ASEAN ASEAN is a, it's an institution with a small I, first of all. It doesn't coordinate very well. It doesn't represent very well. Uh, it's an assemblage of its members, but without a strong secretariat, at least in Brussels on trade policy, for example, and um, their strong leadership. ASEAN for its own intrinsic history and reasons, including the funding of it, um, is not a strong institution. So Americans are misplaced to look at it and think that it is. Um, and no, I, even though they've just had a new charter now five years ago and they've, been, they've had their 70th anniversary, um, I'm also of the view that I'm not dismissive of ASEAN. A lot of, a lot of American analysts are, I think, overly dismissive. It's accomplished a lot uh, in various spheres, including non-traditional security spheres and the absence of war. There has been no interstate war um, since the uh, end of the American uh, Vietnam War. And that wasn't, we weren't an intrinsic state to the region. Yes, there's a lot of, in, of internal security issues. Anyway, to answer your question, I do not anticipate ASEAN evolving into even a union in, in Southeast Asia, much less an Asian union. Um, you know, there's not going to be an Asian version of NATO, RCEP, which is now a reality. You know, it's not going to be what uh, TPP was going to be, and CTTP is uh, still. So, um, you know, it's a set of expectations that I don't think we, we should have of ASEAN. Yeah. Um, Danny Blair, another question. Can you put the Chinese dams on the Mekong River in context for us? Yes, another factor that alienates uh, downriver Southeast Asian countries from China. There are 11 dams that the Chinese have constructed or are in the midst of constructing on the upper Mekong. Um, and that's having all kinds of um, bad effects on diversion of water um, uh, from, the, from Laos, from uh, Thailand and from Vietnam uh, and in Cambodia. So this is a big source of contention between those four states and China, um, uh, as it is in South Asia too, I might, might say, the damming of the rivers off the T Tibetan plateau. Um, so you know, add that to the list of complaint uh, and, and um, sources of anxiety uh, that the Southeast Asians have. Ash K. Smith, asks, you mentioned the importance of the U.S. being there, and this is true, but the U.S., as you just mentioned, is neither a part of RCEP nor the reform TPP. How will China's presence in RCEP 
affect its influence relative to that of the United States? Um, great question. Um, first, I should note that China has an, an FTA with ASEAN already, uh, came into force in 2010, and it's been a great boon and facilitator of trade between China and those 10 member states. So China is um, deeply embedded uh, in the trade regime in Southeast Asia way before, 10 years before RCEP has now come into place. RCEP, as I understand it, is, is basically FTA plus. Um, it's not anywhere near what TPP aspired to or what CTTP has become, um, but it's better to have it um, than not from the Asian standpoint. And it's better to have China in it than not. Uh, if China, it's better to have China in institutions if they meet the criteria for membership. Um, I'm all in favor of that. So TPP, um, first of all, the United States, the Biden administration should rethink and rejoin. That's step one, should go right there with the rejoining the World Health Organization, Climate Change Accord and the Iran Nuclear Accord. Then you go, you rejoin uh, TPP. If China meets the standards of TPP, fine, we can have negotiations to bring them in. The United States needs to do that, I would say. Yes, is out of the game. APEC, not a particularly important actor anymore. Uh, it's a facilitator, essentially, of bilateral meetings between heads of state when they go every year. Um, East Asian Summit, mind you, there's this whole architecture of multilateralism and what uh, Kurt Campbell and others like to call mini-lateralism in the region. And the US is an episodic presence and participant at best in these. We've got to get in that game. We've got to show up um, and participate uh, and be at the table, I would argue, in, in those. And that means the president of the United States too has to fly out there. It's a long way to go, um, but it's worth, it uh, pays multiple dividends. Steve Jackson asks, what role can the Quad play in giving Southeast Asian countries a more subtle and flexible alternative to China strategically? Uh, great question, Steve. In all disclosure, Steve and I were PhD classmates at Michigan together. <laughs> He's another uh, product of Michael Oxenberg and Alan Whiting. Um, and good question, Steve. The Quad, of course, Southeast Asia is not a member of the Quad. The Quad is Australia, Japan, United States, India. Um, and no Southeast Asian country, including Vietnam, would want to join such a grouping. Uh, the group is all about constrainment of China, I would argue. Not containment, but constrainment. Um, and Southeast Asia doesn't want to be part of, of um, of constrainment, you know, they want to have balance. They want to perhaps balance China, but they don't want to get uh, too deeply involved in the kind of security uh, and intelligence relationships that do exist with the Quad. Uh, they want the sweet spot for Southeast Asia uh, is their more autonomous, neutral, independent position. They don't want to get too close. Uh, to the U.S. and an arrangement like the Quad, which you know, necessitates that, is not something I think Southeast Asian countries are necessarily comfortable with. Mm -hmm. David, I know you you have a uh, you have a class to teach. Do you have an extra five minutes or no? I do. I told my class we'd start at ten after the hour. So okay, good. Because there's some great questions that have come in, and I and I really would want to ask them. One is from uh, Mary Gallagher. Um, how have Southeast Asian countries with large Muslim populations reacted to the camps in Xinjiang? Are they more vocally in opposition than governments in Central Asia? Great question, Mary. Um, and uh, it's one of these issues that I encountered multiple instances of in Southeast Asia when it comes to China, where there's a lot of hand wringing and angst uh, that goes on but is not voiced publicly. There is a lot of concern from my last visits to Indonesia and Malaysia um, just uh, last year over the Xinjiang uh, internments, but neither and both are predominantly Islamic states, uh, is Indonesia being the largest in the world, um, but neither of those governments uh, have gone public uh, to condemn them. 
or to express any kinds of, of concern. And so, but that's not to say that there isn't concern. It's just that <laughs> this gets into the leverage that Beijing has over these countries, um, I would argue. And Beijing has already acquired, I argue in the book, a kind of veto power over uh, discourse in particular. Certain things that Southeast Asian countries would otherwise want to say and say publicly, they won't say because there will be a cost. Um, China has that capability, that deterrent, you might call it, capability. And so Southeast Asians are not at all happy with things like that, or the South China Sea, or even Tibet, or Chinese mercantilist uh, practices, or even BRI. There are a lot of issues that the Southeast Asians are not happy about with China, but they don't go public on it. And I would, I would put the Xinjiang issue in that category. Um, and I'm not sure what it would take, you know, to get them to become more vocal. Same applies, as you indicate, Mary, to the Central Asian states and even Turkey and beyond. Great question. Um, trying to answer these. Questions continue to flood in, and they're great questions. Um, uh, Sheldon Pang, see if you can be brief on this answer. How would you describe the relationship between ADB and AIIB? Complementary or competitive? Oh, very complementary. Um, and in fact, the AIIB uh, template um, was really copied, it was written by Natalie Lichtenstein and from a kind of World Bank template, but it's not dissimilar at all from the ADB's template, rules of governance and so on. Moreover, they're cooperating together on a lot of projects in the region. And C, what is it? Um, the ADB. Should America rejoin? Should America join AIIB? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and, but just the ADB estimates that there are $2.7 trillion of needed infrastructure to be built in the region by, I think, 2023. And that um, China, ADB, World Bank, all the existing funders are never, not even get to 50% of that level. So short answer is they're very complimentary and we should be working with both. All right, second to last question. Um, this one, again, from Denny, but I think they're so great. The Obama administration faithfully attended all the Southeast Asia uh, gatherings, yet I did not observe U.S. influence in the region or any advantage over China from these efforts. Did you? Yeah, I did, Denny, actually. And I argue in the book that America's relations with Southeast Asia were never better than during the Obama years in general. Some of that had to do with Obama himself, having grown up six years of his youth in Indonesia. He himself visited, I have the statistic in the book, I believe um, every Southeast Asian country except Brunei, and there was a visit that was canceled, but the Sultan of Brunei came to the White House. Um, and he showed up at the uh, uh, East Asia summit once it was started. And a number of Southeast Asians I interviewed for this uh, book um, all spoke glowingly of the Obama presence and efforts and call it's that kind of intensive it's very labor intensive it's not just symbolic it is somewhat symbolic to show up but you've got to uh, do your work too um, so I don't mean to disagree with you Danny but I and you've had longer experience in the region uh, than I have but I think it really resonated very positively actually with regional states which probably would tell us what your answer to the final question is going to be. Uh, it's from Mike Coleman, but if Mike didn't answer, ask it, I would have asked it, which is what are a few specific actions that the Biden administration to take, should take in Southeast Asia to kind of be more present and do um, what you think they should do? Oh gosh, right off the top of my head. Uh, first thing is to nominate ambassadors for all 10 countries and get them confirmed within the first 90 days. We've just gone through four years without an ambassador in Singapore. And I think some other places. <laughs> We've had long vacancies in Bangkok and so on. So we gotta have, part of showing up is to have a, a presence in the ambassador corps. Number two, rejoin TPP. Number three, launched negotiations for a regional FTA with ASEAN, the same as China has. Um, 
let's see, number four, keep doing what we're doing on the security assistance front. A lot of good success story there. Number five, increase scholarships for Southeast Asian students uh, to the United States. We already have 45,000 Southeast Asian students in American universities last academic year, but that, those could be easily doubled. Um, so off the top of my head, um, those are, and then the Secretary of State needs to visit quarterly. Um, and as Danny Blair quite knows, the SYNCPAC commander does visit quarterly. We have a very consistent naval and military presence in the region. It's our civilians that are the problem, I think. And so we've got to get greater um, circulation uh, through the region and not just fly in, fly out, as I say, that sort of parachute diplomacy that Southeast Asians expect of us. And we've got to change that expectation. Yeah, I believe that the professionalism that, that we're going to see in the U.S. State Department, the National Security Council, Defense Department, et cetera, are going to lead to, I think, a lot of the things that you're talking about. This has given you a flavor of <laughs> David's new book, Where Great Powers Meet, America, China, and Southeast Asia. This has been a wonderful discussion. And after this discussion, I, I expect your book sales to soar. And I, I'm so happy that you did your, your launch with the National Committee uh, as an old friend and somebody who's provided enormous value to us over a very, very long time. David, thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. Steve, Dwoshia, Dwoshia.